extreme events in ocean systems. Uh, the lectures, we'll have two lectures today, as you all know. So we'll have one lecture, then a break, and then at 3.15 we'll have the second lecture. So please all stick around and uh, you're all welcome to join us for the reception, the break. Uh, the two lectures today, uh, the first one will be discussing impacts of El Nino oscillations, and the second one changes in the deep sea environment due to asteroid impacts. And then tomorrow there'll be a talk on changes in ocean currents in the Atlantic Ocean, and then a follow-on <coughs> talk on the impacts of low oxygen uh, regions in the oceans. So I think we have a pretty exciting lineup of topics. Tonight, uh, we're also having uh, a special event at the Dali Museum called the St. Petersburg Sci Cafe. And there'll be uh, a group of people from the college, as well as one of our speakers, Dr. Chavez, will be talking about extreme events from climate to, climate to sardines. And you're all welcome to join, that, um, join us at that. It's a free event at the Dali, starts at 6 o'clock with a reception and then a panel discussion from 6.30 to 7.30. So I hope we'll see all of you there. So it is my honor um, to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Francisco Chavez, who's from the Monterey Bay Research Institute. He's originally from Peru. He received a Bachelor of Science degree at Humboldt State University in California and then a PhD from Duke University. And he's been at uh, the Monterey Bay Research Institute for more than 30 years, or I guess up to 30 years just now. Um, he's a founding, one of the founding members or scientists that were originally hired there. Um, while he's been there, he's pioneered time series research and developed new instrumentation and systems to make time series types of research sustainable. And he's also a fellow of the American Association for Advancement of Science, um, and he was honored for his distinguished research um, on impacts of climate variability in ocean systems. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Shepard. Somehow the uh, screen went off. Turning on the mic, did that change the? No. It was, on, it was, right, it was right here before. Okay. 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 There we go. Just adjust your volume for your microphone. Okay. Well, I want to thank the uh, uh, faculty of uh, USF for inviting me to uh, give this talk. It was a little bit of a challenge uh, for me to put something like this together, and so uh, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll see how we go. Normally I, uh, I give a little uh, something about uh, the nature of Ambari, uh, the Monterey Bay Aquarium Research Institute. It was founded by uh, uh, David Packard uh, following the very successful aquarium that uh, he and his daughters built uh, in the early 80s. Uh, and I uh, was fortunate enough, as, as Kendra said, to go to Mbari uh, uh, straight out of my PhD because the first director of the institute uh, was my PhD advisor, Dick Barber. Uh, and then kind of going first full circle, the present director, Chris Sholin, was my first postdoc at Mbari. And I, I, uh, I, I like to tell people to be nice to their postdocs and students because you never know when they can become <laughs> Boss. Anyway, uh, uh, today I'm going to take you on a little bit of a tour. Uh, this is the general outline. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about uh, uh, what we know about uh, ocean variability and change from the global perspective and, and, and looking at how ecosystems respond. Uh, speak really briefly about the wonderful observing system we have for uh, 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 physics and a couple of other properties and then uh, argue for the need for improved observations of life in the sea and focus on new methods and technology. So there's, there's really two, uh, uh, two presentations in one. The first one is about the science of, of uh, climate variability, and the second one is 
uh, what can we do about learning about uh, how life in the sea is changing? Because I, uh, some of us think that's an important topic today. Uh, so there's, there are uh, uh, multiple time series of uh, uh, changes in, in the world. Of course, the famous ice core CO2 record uh, 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 showing where we are at present. Uh, um, uh, records from sea level gauges. Uh, this one happens to be from San Francisco showing that in general there has been an increasing trend, but that trend is not necessarily smooth. There's periods when the uh, trend increases rapidly, then there's times when it decreases, it's f kind of flat, increases again. And then uh, uh, recently, uh, and, and up to the, pre the uh, recent El Nino, there had been a decline of about uh, uh, 10 or 15 years, and I'll talk a little bit more about that when I get to the top panel. And if we look at, at uh, 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 catch of a particular species, in this case, I've, I, I've plotted the catch of the Peruvian anchoveta in red and the Peruvian sardine catch in blue. And if I was going to plot the catch of Japan sardine, it would fall almost identically on top of this uh, a blue line here, showing that in uh, periods of, of multi-decades, the uh, uh, fish, which probably have better sensors of the environment than we do, are feeling some kind of a signal, and it's uh, uh, resulting in, in changes in abundance, at least at the local level, of these species that last for an order of 20 to 30 years. Then we take uh, 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 the only real uh, time series that we have that goes back this long that is globally distributed, and that's sea surface temperature, and we calculate the mean anomaly for the world uh, monthly. This is what, this, uh, uh, what the record looks like, and it looks a little bit like sea level. There's a period uh, uh, where there's a cooling, and then there's a rapid warming, and then there's a, uh, a flattening out, and then again this uh, 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 rapid increase, and then another uh, uh, flattening out uh, uh, that's referred to in the present day literature as the uh, hiatus in global warming, which was broken during the uh, recent 2015-16 El Nino. That El Nino does have a pretty significant impact on uh, SSTs. This happens to be 97-98, which was a really big El Nino. But anyway, in general, uh, there's this increasing trend that, of course, we're all concerned about. If we then take that uh, global uh, uh, SST record and detrend it and tr start to look at the uh, different types of variability in the uh, SST record, we uh, come up with this picture. And let me take a, a moment to sort of work you through these. These are the first modes of uh, EOF analysis of the global SST record that has been detrended, uh, as I said earlier. Uh, the first mode is El Nino. And uh, the way you interpret these maps is you look at the time series, which is colored, and you take, for example, in 1940, it was negative. You multiply this entire map by that value, and that would actually turn this area warm. So this, this uh, 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 feature here, which is the El Nino feature, in 1940, which was an El Nino year, would be warm and red. The same is true in 97, 98, and 82, 83. And on top of that, in, in these records, we've plotted uh, the, be the best index that we have of, or you could probably plot anyone for El Nino, on top of the uh, principal component time series. And that's in the black line, the MEI. You really can't distinguish it from this record because it tracks it pretty much exactly. The second mode is actually one that is close to uh, uh, you folks, and that's the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, which is a much longer period oscillation. And if we would have done this analysis over a much shorter time period, it wouldn't show up. But since we have 100 years, and this is, uh, 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 has periods of 50, 50 to 70 years, it shows up uh, pretty strongly. And there's a number of papers in the literature now showing the impacts of, uh, of the AMO on uh, 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 local ecosystems. And that's the map, and this is the time series. The uh, third one is associated with something that we call the Pacific Decadal Oscillation. I, 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 I'll show you another image of it in a little while, 
and, it, and, and that image looks more like El Nino. I, I have tried to use the term El Viejo and La Vieja for this uh, uh, process, and, and I guess some of you know Spanish, and so you know why, why that is. It's a much longer uh, term uh, 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 oscillation running anywhere from 20 to 40 years, positive or negative. The fourth mode captures two uh, 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 indices. It captures something that has been recently named the El Nino Modoki Index. And uh, Modoki in Japanese is like but not the same. So we have uh, 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 something that's like an El Nino, but it wasn't the El Nino that we knew uh, prior to the uh, uh, 90s. In the US, they often call it the Central Pacific El Nino. And rather than having this very warm uh, 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 connection to the coast of Peru, uh, that, that uh, warming is restricted to the Central Pacific. Uh, and the, uh, the recent El Nino was kind of a hybrid uh, of both of those, and we'll talk a little bit about that. The other one is a uh, uh, index coined by uh, Manu Di Lorenzo called the North Pacific Gyre Oscillation. And uh, it is intermediate in terms of its uh, uh, frequency between El Nino and the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, so it's more decadal. And the in, one, a couple of interesting things with, the, with these indices is it looks like they've increased in amplitude recently. And uh, I don't know if that's something to do with what we are doing or if that's just a, a climate cycle that we just haven't seen yet. So let's look at uh, El Nino with a little more uh, detail. Uh, and here I've taken that same image and you can invert the colors of the map if you incur invert the time series. And I, on the top here, I, I've labeled uh, the, sort of the big El Ninos that we've had in the past record. And I, I, this was updated, I think, uh, uh, the beginning of the year, and this would be a little lo uh, longer lasting, but the 2015 El Nino starts to show up, 97, 98, 82, 83, 72, 73, 57, 58. Uh, um, I'm not gonna talk much about the, uh, the drivers of El Nino but, and some of the other cycles, but, let's, but we'll do to uh, some degree. This is a, a cartoon uh, uh, that has been around for some time. The trade winds uh, drive uh, water and heat uh, from the eastern Pacific to the western Pacific so that sea level in Indonesia is typically 40 centimeters higher than it is uh, uh, on the Galapagos Island or the coast of Peru. Uh, that process deepens the thermocline in the western Pacific and brings it closer to the surface in the eastern Pacific. And since this uh, uh, water underneath the thermocline is kind of like a compost, it also enriches uh, the Eastern Pacific waters. Uh, for uh, uh, reasons that are still poorly understood, even though we've spent a, a significant amount of money trying to predict and forecast El Nino, uh, the, the Indonesian low starts to migrate into the Pacific, and behind it, uh, we generate these westerly wind bursts. Those wind bursts uh, 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 then generate Kelvin waves that propagate across the Pacific and, and act to deepen the uh, uh, thermocline in the uh, east and raise it in the west and results in the warming of this area that's normally unusually cool. If we look at that, those same processes with some real data, uh, uh, th these are uh, time series or uh, people call them Hofmuller plots. A meteorologist usually put time uh, uh, going up in this direction. And then uh, 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 th th this is from Indonesia to Peru. These are repeated in terms of their uh, time and uh, longitude axis, but we're plotting winds, the depth of the 20 degree isotherm, which is the thermocline, and sea surface temperature. These red areas here are these we westerly wind bursts measured by uh, 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 moorings of the tau array. And each one of these, you can associate with a, a, a deepening of the thermocline. And if we take the slope of this line uh, over the time, uh, uh, it, it ca you can calculate the speed at which these waves propagate. And it's on the order of 200 kilometers a day. 
And so you can follow each one of these across, and the thermocline uh, uh, continuously deepens in the eastern Pacific. Eventually, that, that, those processes, together with advection, result in an anomalously warm SST in the uh, eastern Pacific. And after an El Nino, there is typically uh, a La Nina, which is the cool phase of the El Nino phenomena. If we look at the, uh, uh, um, oh, went the wrong way. Okay, sorry. Uh, um, what has actually happened, and I actually downloaded this. This is a, another of the wonders of, of today. Uh, I, I was able to get online this morning and, up and provide a, a, an updated version of what is happening in the Pacific uh, on the same. I, I've confused you a little bit because these two are swapped in the, uh, in, in, compared to the previous uh, slide. But again, during 2015 and 16, you can see these westerly wind bursts uh, associated with these Kelvin waves propagating across the Pacific, generating this warming. And this warming actually looks like it in, at the end turns out to be more in the central Pacific. And if we go back and forth from here, and, and I, I, I apologize, and you look at the edge of this, and you look also at the intensity of this, you'll see the difference between uh, the 97-98 El Nino and the 2015 and 16 one. So while El Nino 2015-16 was big, it wasn't as some were calling it Godzilla. Uh, and, and it ended up being something of a hybrid between the Eastern Pacific and the Central Pacific. Uh, as Kendra said, I was born and raised in Peru in fact, I was born in a little town here called Talara. Uh, I, I grew up in Lima and then somehow made it to college to Humboldt State and I survived that adventure uh, and, and went on to Duke uh, uh, where I work with Dick Barber. Uh, and, and with Dick, we returned to uh, 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 Peru to study the natural uh, 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 climate uh, or natural uh, variability of the Peru upwelling system, uh, uh, Dick uh, uh, hypothesized that just as the uh, physical oceanographers could take sea level and track the propagation of events uh, across the Pacific and up and down the coast, biologists should be able to do the same thing. And so we established two stations, one in the Galapagos uh, around here and another one in Paita, and we wanted to see if we could catch propagating activity that came down uh, and across the coast. Uh, uh, everything changed because uh, uh, of El Nino. We established the uh, uh, time series in Paita in June of 1982, and then in September 22nd of 1982, the temperature increased by the order of four degrees in one day and kept increasing. Uh, over time until at one point the monthly mean anomaly in temperature was uh, 10 degrees centigrade. And that's uh, 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 a pretty significant, I was talking with Mark Luther asking him what would happen in St. Petersburg if the waters were 16 degrees Fahrenheit warmer than average. I, I'm not sure we, we got to an answer. But anyway, that uh, basically changed my life. Uh, we had some very high technology uh, there at that time. I, I, we rented a fishing boat and had a manual winch that we lowered uh, uh, nisking balls with. We brought the water up to the surface, put a thermometer in it, measured temperature, collected nutrients, uh, uh, samples for phytoplankton, etc. But we were able to capture uh, uh, in uh, pretty uh, complete detail what happened during an El Nino for the first time. And El Nino, of course, not only affects uh, uh, the ocean, but it has a significant imp impact uh, uh, on the local uh, terrestrial environments. It, it is normally a uh, uh, des desert off of uh, northern Peru and, and Puta. Uh, and when I returned uh, after the big rains, I found uh, uh, ducks and lakes and it, the, the whole a desert had completely transformed. Same thing happened in the Galapagos. This is a picture of uh, uh, El Galapagos during a cool year, 
and during El Nino, and, and here is Dick Barber, I think this was on the Endeavour during one of our cruises. If we then uh, uh, start to look at uh, 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 properties other than temperature, uh, we find that El Nino signatures permeate throughout that. And here are, are, uh, uh, is the same analysis for uh, SST, but we've added uh, uh, sea level from the modern satellite era and chlorophyll from ocean color from the modern satellite area. And if you plot those time series, uh, uh, at the end here, we've plotted all of those over each other. And at, at this resolution, you can't tell the difference. So the, these properties are varying on, at the same, uh, uh, in, in exactly the same manner uh, over uh, 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 these global scales. And if we look at that in a little more detail, you see that they're not exactly the same, but they tend to uh, track each other. And here I focused on, on marine primary production, and the, in the colors are the anomalies in production calculated from satellite algorithms. And, and we've also plotted the uh, uh, EOFs of SST, sea level, uh, uh, atmospheric sea level pressure, uh, and the uh, MEI, which is the El Nino index. And the range of anomalies is similar to that that we observe over terrestrial environments, and it's the order of uh, four to six gigatons of carbon, and each of these contributes about 50 gigatons of carbon per year globally. And so the order of the anomalies associated with these events is about 10% of the global productivity. And this is the ocean, the, the ocean observing system that now allows us, it's focused on the Pacific, but it really is globally distributed. In the Pacific, we're, we're fortunate to have more of these moorings along the equator from the Tau array, although they're growing out into the Indian Ocean and into the Atlantic as well. Uh, we have these uh, 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 now uh, uh, multiplying Argo profiling floats that cover a degree uh, or uh, every three degrees of ocean uh, uh, on a regular basis, profiling down to up to 2,000 meters, and now even going deeper with deep Argo. There are drifters, uh, there's, and then there's some emerging technologies, and I'll talk to you about those more in a little bit. And we have this wonderful... Uh,